Well, good morning. How are you all today? If you're hot, I'm cold, so we try to find a happy medium. I had to turn that fan off. I don't want it blowing at me. Um, you know, I usually start by just giving you some what I call tweets. They're just one-liners that impacted me, that either made me laugh or made me think. So here's some of those. He who knows himself best esteems himself least. I think the older I get, the less I esteem myself because I'm getting to know myself better and we'll just leave that right there. <laughs> if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Yeah? Five seconds of good judgment can prevent a lifetime of regret. That is a lesson I have learned over and over again. <laughs> Five seconds of good judgment. The goal of marriage is not to think alike, but to think together. I like that one. Isn't that true? Not to think alike, but to think together. Sometimes we learn the most about God from the situations we understand the least. True? And one more. This last one is my most favorite tweet that I found in probably six months. And I know that's saying a lot because I give you tweets all the time. I have quoted this so much, it may not be new for some of you, but it's just truth and it made me laugh. But it takes two years to learn to speak and 50 years to learn not to. <laughs> two years to learn to speak and 50 years to learn to keep your mouth shut, <laughs> right? I'm 48, so I am almost learned this, but I'm, I'm, I'm just on the prefaces of, of getting it. Well, we're studying the book of Acts together. If you would turn with me to Acts chapter 3. I thought Ken's sermon on this passage last week was just outstanding. It so touched my heart. And you know, the Bible is so clear to us that as followers... As believers of Jesus, Ken gave us scripture after scripture after scripture that we need to be a people who takes care of the poor. But if you're like me, and you may be or you may not be, but if you're like me, I can get so focused on not wanting to feed someone's addiction, you following me, that I don't give it all. And I think that's wrong. According to the Bible, I see that that's wrong. And so last week's sermon was so convicting to me. And, and, and so I walked out of here God, saying, God, where I've just put blinders up, would you forgive me? And would you give me your eyes? And would you give me your heart? And would you give me your discernment? And God, in all of that, would you make me a cheerful giver? 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, God loves, you finish it with me, God loves what? A cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. When, back in the 1970s when I was growing up in this church, we used to sing, God loves a cheerful giver, so give it all you got. That is straight out of 1970s, and so is the tune. But you know, there, that, that's truth. I, I want to be a cheerful giver, and if God is putting on my heart to give to the poor, God, make me obedient. Make us as a church obedient. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are on their way to a prayer meeting. And I don't think they ever get there. I don't think they ever get to the prayer meeting. And, I, you know, I'm just one that always kind of thinks between the lines, but I thought, I wonder if some religious folk would be tempted to judge Peter and John for never getting to the prayer meeting that they were supposed to get to. And it convicted me of how often do we just look at little narrow of, of our, well, you didn't get to the prayer meeting, instead of God used them supernaturally to heal someone. And it just, I just was like, God, make me less judgmental. Just keeping it real here. So they're on their way to the prayer meeting. They come across a guy who, Acts chapter 3 tells us, he's been crippled since birth. He would probably had a birth deformity. He was crippled since the day he was born. Every day he sits at the temple gate and he pleads for money, day after day. And on this particular day, two men named Peter and John walk by and they catch his eye. And can we assume that they, most people don't catch a beggar's eye unless they plan to give something? Right? Are you with me? You kind of just look down or you look away or whatever. But Peter and John catch his eye, and then they say, silver and gold I don't have any of. And the guy must think, well, this is a twist. <laughs> but then 
They come back, and Peter says, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have is even better. And Peter speaks healing over this man, and through Peter's words and through Peter's actions, and and this is brave. Let me tell you, Peter was brave, was he not? Because he speaks healing, the guy's still sitting there, right? So then he goes up and he grabs the, the crippled guy and picks him up. That took courage, did it not? and picked him up, and instantly, I mean, I would have loved to see it, because in my mind, the guy's legs were deformed, and so they must have started growing. They must have developed muscle tone. He picked him up, and he sat him on his, on his feet, and restores this guy to, to full health, and you might think, well, the story ends there. Peter and John go on into the temple to their prayer meeting, and the healed guy just heads home, But that's not what happens. The story doesn't end there. Instead, this guy, the scripture says, clings, literally clings, holds on to Peter and John. And I love this next phrase that Ken talked about last week, but he wasn't just holding on to them, but what was he doing? He was jumping and leaping and praising the Lord. And you know what? Our church, I love that picture. I can just, it's like I can see a movie of it in my brain. You know, at our church, we do that too. We do some jumping and we do some leaping, and people might think we're a little odd, and we are, so it's okay. (laughs) But see, if you're like me, when your life has been so totally transformed by the love of Jesus, when you have hope that you wouldn't have, when you have peace that surpasses understanding, when you know that no matter what you've done, God forgives, forgives you, and when God looks at you, you're cloaked with Jesus, When you see the power of God working in your life and in your family's life and you just are in awe and grateful, you can't help but jump a little bit, you know? Because you want to just express to God utter gratitude and thanks, right? The jumping isn't say, hey, look at me. I uh, I can jump with heels on and and I don't anymore uh, because I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, but, but I did manage to get my shoes off and on without causing too much disturbance at the keyboard this morning. But you know what? I'm, I want to jump before God and praise him just like this guy here because God's healed me too from the inside out. You know, this lame guy has never walked a day in his life. And from here on, I'm going to call the crippled guy, the crippled beggar, our guy. Okay, he's our guy. Okay, that's his name. He has never walked a day in his life. And Acts 4.22, Ken pointed this out last week too, it says that he's been lame for more than 40 years. Think about that. I mean, even if God was to come in and and, and supernaturally heal his paralysis, and I, I, I led up to this just a minute ago, but think about it more. He would not be humanly able, after being crippled for 40 years, to even put any weight on his legs. Being upright would probably make him nauseous like that. He wouldn't be able to balance or to walk, much less jump. He wouldn't have muscle tone or strength. His legs, I think, were deformed. It would literally take, there, there's doctor here this morning. There were doctors in first service. There's a lot of nurses in here this morning. And I don't pretend to be a medical expert in any stretch of the imagination, but I know enough to know that It wasn't just a miracle that he was healed. It was a miracle that he was able to jump and leap and have balance and even stand up and walk. It would have taken, from a human perspective, months, if not even more than a year or two, to help him learn to have balance and to stand on his own feet and to walk. I mean, a couple of you recently have had hip surgery or knee replacement surgery, and just learning to walk and function again with new parts in your body is not easy. He'd never walked a day in his life. And yet he's jumping and leaping and praising God. And because of this, the crowd was stunned. The crowd was in awe. And I, don't, I think maybe they saw his legs grow. I don't know. I'm just making that up. The scripture doesn't say. But I wonder. The crowd was in, with, in awe. So read this with me again. I'm going to pick up a little bit of what Ken read last week and then just keep going. Uh, Acts 3, verse 8. Read with me. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says as he, our guy, he jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with all of them. And all the people, notice that, all the people saw him walking around praising God. And when they realized that he was the lame beggar that they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, 
They were absolutely astounded, and they rushed out in a Solomon's Columnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. And Peter saw this opportunity and addressed the crowd, and he said, People of Israel, what is so surprising about this? And why do you stare at us as though we made this man walk by our own power or our own godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, who brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed and you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you, have, what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance, but God, but God, remember CJ's, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again send you you, Jesus, your appointed Messiah. Think about this, the crowd's response. It's, it's interesting to me, this crowd's response, because this is the second miracle in the book of Acts. It's the second miracle of the early church. The first miracle was at Pentecost when the 120 were in the upper room and they all began to speak in other tongues, speaking known languages that they'd never studied and never known. And it was a miracle. And remember that the crowd at that time was critical of the disciples saying, you're just drunk. Remember that? You're just drunk. But in the second miracle, the crowd's response is almost the opposite. They assumed that it was Peter and John's holiness, Peter and John's piety or godliness that creates this miracle. And Peter answers their speculation and their thought there by saying, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Instead of being hostile this time saying, you guys are just drunk, the crowd this time gives Peter and John too much credit. Do you see that? The first miracle, they got criticism. This second miracle, they get praise. And it reminds me of a tweet that I think would be good for us to remember and take to heart. If we don't live by the praises of men, we won't die by their criticisms. You know, I have met people, all of us need praise. All of us need uh, affirmation. We need others to build us up. As, as wives, that's one of our, 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 the things that we're called to do is build up our husbands. But all of us need a, a certain level of you're doing a good job, uh, you, that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? But I have met people that are just sponges that way. They, they just absorb it. Like It's just like it's almost a need in them. But the problem with that is that then when they get criticized or when they're, you know, corrected in, in, in hopefully a righteous way, they can't handle it because they're living by the praises of men. And so they're then feel like they're dying by their criticisms. And the point is, God, help me to be pleasing to you and help me to love others, but help me not to just need praise. Do you see what I'm saying? We all need affirmation, but don't make praise an idol. I guess that's what I'm saying. And, and, if, and, and some of us are inclined that way and others aren't. But if you're inclined that way, just say, God, maybe that's an idol for me. And the reason why I feel like I'm not very teachable is because I need praise so much that I can't handle criticism. You following me? If we don't live by the praises of men, we won't die by their criticisms. Interesting to me that in the first two miracles, the disciples were criticized and then praised. And I don't think Peter took either to heart. Peter took this opportunity to preach his second sermon. And I, this sermon is so interesting to me because Peter compels the crowd. He has this captive audience, right? Because they've just seen this guy miraculously healed. It's shocking. They're stunned. And he takes this opportunity and he compels the crowd to look at themselves honestly. 
Peter doesn't hold back any punches. He says, look at, look at how it says this. Peter says, Jesus is the source of healing. And then he says, this is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected. He says, you rejected the holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of the murderer. Peter is not all that kind here. He uses a personal pronoun, you. He doesn't say some people. There were some. He says, you. And then he makes it, drives home the, the punch, if you will. He says, you killed the author of life. You did it. I love that play on words. You killed the author of life. And I would just say this, looking at this sermon, for anyone to have a genuine, life-changing encounter with the living God where he changes you and transforms you from the in inside out, you first have to take an honest look at yourself, at your sin. See, Peter doesn't preach, oh, God loves you so much. And if you just make him your savior, all of your problems will go away. And it doesn't really matter if you don't sin anymore because you just live under grace. That's not what Peter preaches. He says, you killed the author of life. And my point is, is that to really receive the good news of the gospel, we kind of need to look at the bad news first. Does that make sense? And the bad news is our sin. And we've got to own our sin and face it. See, in order to truly appreciate a Savior, to really love and worship and honor and follow and, and exalt our Savior, the Savior, we first need to realize that we need saving. In order to be washed clean and renewed, you first have to look at the fact that you're guilty and dirty. Amen? Amen? And that's the way Peter preaches the gospel. He doesn't water it down. It's not all that feel good of a message that he gives. But he made them look at their sin, and we need to do the same. See, when we really look at our sin, when I really look at my sin, my past sin and the sin I still struggle with, when I really look at it, then I don't take the Savior for granted. And I don't treat Jesus in a flippant, superficial, I deserve to be saved kind of way. See, their sin, the people of this time, and our sin, and people all through the ages sin, put Jesus on the cross. My sin, your sin, put Jesus on the cross. And Jesus paid for our sin dearly. But the truth of the gospel is this. God is going to judge sin. There will be punishment for sin. And he can judge you and punish you for your sin. Or he can judge Jesus and he's punished Jesus already for your sin. And everybody has a choice. Do I want to stand in my own righteousness and see how I stand before a holy, righteous God? Or do I want to cloak myself with the blood of and the garment of Jesus, and have God judge and look at me through the lens of Jesus. Everybody has a choice of whether to accept or reject the Savior. And it will be dependent on how God views you and your sin. And when you look at it that way, doesn't it just make you stand in awe of Jesus and thank him? We can use that phrase, Savior, that word Savior, so flippantly. And yet when you really look at the ugliness of sin and the fact that God is going to judge it and then you see Jesus come stand right in front of you. Jesus who knew no sin or the sin of the world bore my sin on his body and when God judges sin he if I if I've if I'm a I've confessed with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord then God looks at Jesus and sees Jesus in me. Peter doesn't preach a feel-good message. He preaches truth. Yeah? You killed the author of life. In 17, Peter continues with his sermon, and he says, friends or brothers, and I'm wondering at this point if he's wondering if they're his friends. 
because of how he's kind of packed a punch. And so he softens the tone a little bit. He says, verse 17, he says, friends are brothers. And he said, you killed them out of ignorance. And then he identifies himself with them by saying, friends are my brothers. You're brothers with me. And I think here, Peter isn't promoting himself saying, I didn't kill Jesus. You killed Jesus, but I didn't kill Jesus. He doesn't try to propagate their thought that he is in a superior in a pious kind of godly way. And that's why this guy was healed. Instead, Peter says, as friends and brothers were in this together. And he says, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins will be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. Look at how those two things go together. You know, we live in a day, and see if you agree with this, where times of refreshment are few and far between. I got together with some friends yesterday that I hadn't seen for 25 years friends from college. We had a little reunion with Campus Crusade for Christ. It had a reunion in Boulder. Ken and I went, and I was surprised by how many people said, I'm just so busy. Everybody's so busy. No matter what you're doing, you're busy. Life is busy. And don't we need times of refreshment? And they seem few and far between. But you know, the truth of the matter, the way I see this is that one of the reasons, I think, why we struggle with times of refreshment is that we also live in a day where owning and facing our sin honestly, falling on our face in repentance and bowing before a holy God and owning our sin is also few and far between. Smile at me. It's so easy to say, well, I didn't mean it that way, or it was an accident, or you're interpreting that wrong. It's just your perspective. Instead of saying, I messed up. Up. I'm not a mess up, but I messed up. I'm not a failure, but I failed. So the enemy will try to get us and attack our identity. You're a failure, you're a loser, condemnation. That's not Jesus. But Jesus says, own it, acknowledge it. And when you do that, then what's the promise? Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And one of my prayers, I come, my sermon kind of has two parts this morning. This is the first part. One of my prayers for us as we leave here is that each of us will take stock of our own lives and say, God, is there anything in me that's dirty? David prayed in Psalm 51, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. And just to say, God, I want to take stock of my life. I want to analyze my life. And I want to walk before you with a clear conscience, living in truth, living clean. And when I mess up, I don't want to sweep it under the carpet and pretend like it didn't happen. Instead, God, I want to own it and I want to face it. And thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes away my sin. One of my prayers is that we would be a church that walks in repentance. Lord, will you just pray with me? Lord Jesus, would you work repentance in us? Would you work truth in us? God, would you open up our eyes to areas in our lives that we are not clean in? And would you help us to get clean? And would you help us, if necessary, Lord, to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another, James tells us, because the, so that we can be healed, Lord. God, help us to, like Peter preached the, to the... To the to the crowd, Lord, to own their sin, Lord, help us to own our sin. And then help us to embrace the washing power of Jesus that makes us white as snow. And help us never to take Jesus for granted. In Jesus' name. I think in this passage, verse 16 of chapter 3 is probably... Uh, the theme verse. I always look at 316 because of John 316, I always look at all the 316s of the Bible. I don't know why I do that, but I do. And it's so intriguing to me how powerful 316 is in the Bible. But this is, this is uh, Acts 316, and it says this, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. You saw him, Peter's saying. Faith in Jesus Faith in Jesus' name healed this man before your very eyes. And I have read this so many times in so many different passages as I, or in so many different translations as I was getting ready for this sermon. And, and I thought to myself as I read it over and over again, whose faith? Was it Peter and John's faith? Was it the crippled man's faith? Whose faith had an impact here? And, and quite honestly, I'm not sure. It doesn't say, maybe both. But just consider the story again. 
This lame beggar was not ever able to walk. His legs were likely deformed. He had no strength or muscle tone. He never walked a day in his life. And the fact is that he had been lame for 40 years. Now think on this. Put this in context. We can read this by and not think about it. But he had been lame for 40 years. That means that our guy, our crippled guy, he was a young lad when Jesus was born. Think on this. Our guy could have been at the temple begging alms when Joseph and Mary brought baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. He could have been there when Jesus was lost in Jerusalem. Remember that? Remember how Joseph and Mary left Jesus in Jerusalem and started going home? I mean, I've, I've lost a child for a few minutes and there's nothing more scary than that. Imagine if the child was not just your child, but the son of God. That would be horrible. And they lost him for a long time. But you know where he was, the Bible says? I once taught a sermon on don't lose Jesus. I thought it was a great play on words, but Joseph and Mary lost Jesus for a while. <laughs> but you know where Jesus was? The Bible tells us that Jesus is a young child, maybe a young 12, 13 years old, something like that, that Jesus was discussing scriptures with the scholars in the temple. And I thought, I wonder if our guy was there in Psalm. At some guy, our guy got promoted, if you will, to one of the prime begging spots at the temple right at the beautiful gate. And we know from scripture that Jesus came to Jerusalem over and over again, right? And he visited the temple a number of times. Now just think through this with me. If I had been a disabled person and I had heard all these stories of this guy named Jesus healing people and I maybe even have met some of the people that Jesus healed. You know, I was blind, but now I see. Wouldn't you make every effort humanly possible to get Jesus' attention because you want to be healed too? Wouldn't you? I would. So can we not safely assume that our guy probably would too? And if indeed he did, and I think he probably did, he was clearly not successful, <laughs> right? Because he's still the lame beggar in Acts chapter 3. And the last time that Jesus came to Jerusalem, I hadn't seen this before, this hit me. The last time that Jesus came to Jerusalem, he made his triumphal entry. We all know the triumphal entry, right? And our crippled guy must have been at the temple somewhere because he was there every day. And that was his job. Look what Matthew says, the book of Matthew. It says, the blind and the lame came to Jesus or him in the temple courts and Jesus healed them. And when the chief priests and the experts of the law saw the wonderful things Jesus did and heard the children crying out in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, the, the chief priests and, and the, the leaders of the law became indignant. So get this with me. At the triumphal entry, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple courts and he healed him. But somehow, our guy got skipped, passed by. Uh, did he not? So when Jesus was crucified, how, how do you think our guy felt? I mean, Jesus' death would have seemingly been particularly tragic for him because now it would seem that all hope of being healed by the healer was lost. I will be crippled for the rest of my life. I will never know anything different. And so he hangs out at his designated location at the beautiful gate day after day after day after month after month, begging alms. This is his job. And one day, Peter and John enter the temple. And it says, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man, our guy, was healed. So I ask again, whose faith? The beggars? Peter and John's? Again, I'm not sure. I can speculate, but it doesn't say. But let's just take a look at both. Let's explore both. If it was Peter and John's faith, then we should be encouraged. Because that means that someone else's faith can impact our lives. That my faith can produce miracles in your life and your faith can produce miracles in mine. And it gives us a hope for our loved ones that don't have faith. Does it not? And we can pray in faith, believing God to touch them because of our faith in him. Amen. 
And our faith can impact them. Look at what Romans says. It says, help each other with the faith you have. Your faith will help me, and my faith will help you. So if it was Peter and John's faith that impacted this situation, we should be encouraged, yes? But if it was the crippled man's faith, we should still be very encouraged. Why? Because just based on what we know, this man's faith had to have been severely tested. Do you agree? I mean, how strong could it have been? Our guy had every reason in the world to assume that he would never be healed. Jesus had come and gone. Jesus had walked by time and again. And if you were the crippled one, wouldn't you be inclined to lose faith? To lose hope? I will always be this way. Jesus seems to be healing everybody else but me. And I think we can get to a place in life when we go through hard times that we can really struggle with faith, struggle with doubts. What if the Bible isn't actually true? What if I am interpreting God's promises incorrectly? What if my prayers are never answered? What if my loved ones never have an encounter with Jesus? What if God doesn't intervene and the worst possible thing happens? What if I never develop confident faith? Does that mean that God will pass me by? And we can begin to stew on that, and then the enemy lies to us in it, and it just becomes a mess. And, and I'm just keeping it real here. I'm known for that phrase. I'm keeping it real. But putting myself in this crippled guy's shoes, I'm inclined to think that his faith was not enormous. His faith was not enormous because mine would not have been. But you know what? The Bible never says you need enormous faith. In fact, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if you have faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing would be impossible. You know, a mustard seed is the tiniest of particles. It's an undeveloped. It, Jesus didn't say if you had the faith of a mustard plant, right? He said it's a seed. It's undeveloped. It has potential, but it hasn't done anything yet. If you have faith as small as that, that's sufficient. Let me tell you a story about me. Over the last nine months, I have had huge technology problems, bombarded with technology issues, problem after problem. It started when my computer, which was about 10 years old, just started dying on me. I'd be typing, and suddenly I would have the blue screen of death. You know, I hate that screen, where everything's just gone. And it was so frustrating to me because I, I felt like I got to the point where I had to save something every 20 minutes because I never knew when my computer was going to go, I'm done. And so, uh, graciously, the church decided to buy me a new computer. And so I got this new computer, a great computer, and I, I, um, I started transferring everything over from my old computer to this new computer, and it took me hours and hours and literally weeks. I literally worked on it a couple of months. And I'm no computer expert, so I'm not very good at transferring stuff. Um, but just when I was basically finished transferring stuff, right when I had my computer set up just the way I wanted it, it crashed. And it didn't just crash, it fried. In fact, my hard drive fried. Like there was some kind of And sadly, did you appreciate that? That's the way it felt. It wasn't a firework, it was an explosion. And sadly, just a few days before, I had totally wiped my other computer of everything. And so I lost all my data, I lost pictures, I lost songs. It was a sad day in Amy Urban Land. And that very same week, if you can even believe it, this is a true story as I stand before God, this is a true story, everything I'm saying is true. That same week, my iPhone decided to die too. And um, to make matters absolutely horrific, Somehow, parental controls had been set up on my iPhone through my iCloud, probably from kids. The only thing I could figure out and the only thing Apple support figured out is I had let various kids play with my phone, and somehow one of them had set 
password on my parental controls because I didn't set up parental controls on my iPhone, but parental controls with a password. I tried every password I've ever had in my whole life and all of yours. Okay? I, I can't tell you how many passwords I tried. And the really sad thing about iPhone is that you can only try so many bad passwords before they lock you out. So I'd get locked out five minutes and then I'd get locked out 10 minutes and then I'd get locked out 15 minutes, and then before long, I was locked out, I was locked out till tomorrow. But, <laughs> but I, um, but, and this was on a, a new phone I had, but I couldn't retrieve any of my old data. And so Ben and Josh, God bless them, I called them with that mom panic thing going on. And from Boulder and from Fort Collins, they spent hours with me on the phone, helped me trying somehow to, to um, circumvent iTunes, or uh, the Apple's past parental controls password trying to like beat the system I found at least for me the system is not very beatable and so um, I was never able to retrieve anything off of my iPhone it was just all my contacts were gone pictures were gone any picture that I hadn't saved to Dropbox was gone um, all of my anyway all my um, texts and all that stuff was gone I lost all my emails from when the computer crashed now I lost them from my phone it was a nightmare and uh, God is merciful because someone in our church who's a computer genius heard about my sad state of affairs, and he built me another computer, computer and that family actually absorbed all the cost of my new computer and just blessed me and blessed the church. And so for the last six months, I've literally just been rebuilding and rebuilding my technology world, I got a, a new phone from my carrier. Well, not a new phone, I got a refurbished phone from my carrier and I started rebuilding contacts and stuff like that. So if you've gotten a text from me saying, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are, that would be why. And, and I maybe make this sound flippant or breezy up here, but it was absolutely awful. And all of this was going on in the midst of losing my dad. And just the emotional trauma of that, it's been a hard season, fair enough. And within the last month, I feel like I'm finally back to normal, like I have all my contacts and everything was the way I want it, and I breathed a sigh of relief, and then this week happened. So I was sitting at Caleb and Nate's baseball game on Saturday, and I was watching them play baseball, and I picked up my iPhone to text the worship team something for tomorrow, and my screen was black, dead. No, exactly. And, and I knew it was fully charged because I just unplugged it, you know, from the charger. And I was trying so hard not to panic, saying, God, you're God, and Lord, help me not to have a meltdown. I did everything I could do to restart it. You know, I plugged it into a power source. I hit the power button and the, and the, uh, the, the home button, you know, for however long you're supposed to hit it, 20 seconds or whatever. I did that over and over again because I'm kind of an anal obsessive kind of person. And if it doesn't work the first time, try 20 more times. I don't know if you're that way. Um, but my new phone was just done. It was gone, and I thought, this is not happening to me again. And so um, this is literally what I did. I said, God, I was sitting at this baseball game on the stands, and I said, God, if you can heal a crippled beggar who's been lame for 40 years, and you can not only heal him but help him walk and have balance and, like, jump and leap and stuff, then my cell phone is not too difficult for you. But this is the honest to God truth. The next line I said, but God, I don't have the faith for you to heal my phone. You and I both know that, so I might as well be honest, you know? God, I don't think you'll do it. I literally said that. I'm just kind of real up here. Sorry if it's shocking you, but it is who I am. And I, but I just said, God, I know you can. And would you heal my phone? In faith, God, I, I don't have very much faith. I said, God, in fact, I hardly have any at all. And I picked up my phone and you know what? It was still dead. <laughs> and I, I really wanted to chuck it like, Caleb and Nate, how would you feel about a different size baseball? Um, the good news is that I knew that I no longer had parental controls in my iCloud. <laughs> so I knew I would be able to get stuff back. So anyway, the baseball park was close to the church. I'm almost done. Just bear with me a few more minutes. The baseball park was close to the church. Ken was at the church, so I thought I'm gonna drive to Ken and he can tell me what drive to the church so Ken can tell me what to do and so that I can have a meltdown all over him. You should be so glad you're not married to me. And um and so I get to the church, I hand Ken my phone, and I said, It's not working. And so he looks at it, I walk away because I just need a moment, you know, because Caleb and Nate were with me and I don't want to have a total meltdown in front of my kids. And um, I just kind of got away, <sighs> take a few breaths. I walked back in the room and Ken is pushing the home button, the start button, like I had done 20 times. And that little apple appears. 
I have never seen such a beautiful sight in my whole life. And Ken's like, it seems like it's working. And I'm like, what did you do? And he's like, I turned it on. And ever since then, my phone's been fine. And then it gets worse. A few days later, so this was Thursday, today's Sunday, so Saturday, Friday, Thursday, I'm working on this sermon at my house on my computer, and my computer dies. No! And it won't turn back on. It's just black. And I just thought, Lord, you healed my phone. <laughs> would you heal my computer? So I like did everything I could do. I replaced all the cords to see if it was my monitor. I went and got the boys' monitor from downstairs, and I plugged that in. I got nothing. It won't turn on. And by this time, I am smart enough to save stuff on Dropbox, you know, so I wasn't like panicking like I've lost my sermon, but here I'm going to lose my new computer too. And I thought, this is not happening to me, but it was. This is honest to God, is all a true story. <laughs> and uh, Ken backed me up because he had to go through the various meltdown stages that I was having. And, and so I, um, I called Ken and had my meltdown, and the person who actually built my computer, what are the odds? The person who actually built my computer was meeting with Ken right there at that very minute. And so he literally packed himself up, went and got some supplies, and then came to my house, God bless him, and, and began to work on my computer. And he brought a monitor with him, which is actually sitting right there. And um, he plugged it in, and it didn't work. Boy, did that kind of make me happy and kind of sad at the same time, you know? Because then at least it's not just all me. And, and then he was like, yeah, it's something, something's really wrong. And so then he um, just did a hard restart on my computer, which I had done over and over and over again. And it seemed like the computer was on, but there was nothing on the screen. So, you know, a computer that just seems like it's on, but there's nothing on the screen, you know, that's like a brick. You don't, doesn't help you much. And so anyway, he turned it off, turned it back on. And what do you see? You see lettering on my screen and an icon of my video card. And I'm like, what did you do? And he's like, I have no idea. <laughs> So if you would like to pray for me for my technology issues, please feel free. But my computer has been fine since. The guy doesn't know what he did. He doesn't know what went wrong. But anyway, it's working again. I reflected all of this, and I tell you this long story. Sorry it was so long, but it's the truth. I tell you this long story because as I was reflecting on all of this, I thought, God, I don't have very much faith. I really can pray for people at church and really believe, God, that you're going to heal them. But when it comes to technology, God, I don't, I don't have very much faith. In fact, God, I, I hardly have any faith. And I heard God speak to me so clearly. Like, I just knew it was God. And he said, Amy, you had enough faith to pray. You had enough faith to pray to ask me to heal your phone. <laughs> and you had enough faith to ask me to heal your computer. Just enough faith to pray. See, Jesus didn't teach that we have to have faith the size of a mountain to move a mountain. Do you hear me on that? Let me say it again. Jesus did not teach that you have to have faith the size of a mountain to move a mountain. He didn't even say you have to have faith the size of a mustard plant. He said just a mustard seed. And you know, I didn't have very much faith for God to heal my phone or my computer. I had an undeveloped, minuscule mustard seed of faith, but it was enough to cause me to pray. It was enough to move me to pray. And I would just say this to you today. If you are at a place like our guy, the crippled beggar, where life just seems hard, and there's situations in your life that seem hopeless, and it seems like nothing will ever change, and it seems like God is passing you by, where faith, having faith seems impossible, where your, your faith to believe is running on empty, will you just choose to believe just a little bit? Will you choose to believe just a little bit? Hold on to a little bit of faith. And maybe it's just enough faith to pray. Again, we don't need faith the size of mountains to move mountains. But at the same time, I will never move mountains by focusing on the mountains. Yeah? I will never move mountains by focusing on the mountains. I will move mountains by focusing on the God who created the mountains. Right? The God who is in charge of all things. You know, the enemy can lie to us and say, if you just had a little bit more faith. 
He does that, doesn't he? He lies to us that way. But isn't that almost like putting faith in our ability to manufacture faith? And my admonition for you today is that instead of putting your eyes on your faith or your lack thereof, put your eyes on the God. Put your eyes on the Almighty. Beth Moore said this, I read it this week, faith is not believing in my own unshakable belief. Faith is believing in an unshakable God when everything in me trembles and quakes. So to close this morning, would you be like the disciples that said to Jesus, Jesus, will you increase my faith? Increase our faith. And Lord, instead of magnifying my problems, instead of staring at the mountains, instead of just being dehabilitated by my lameness, God, I'm going to magnify you. I'm going to look at you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. I wonder if when, Jesus, when Peter said to that man, look at me, when that man looked at Peter, he saw Jesus. I wonder. At least he saw Jesus in Peter. That man took his eyes off of his lameness and he put his eyes on the Jesus that heals. And see, when we make God huge, huge things can happen in our lives. So instead of beating yourself up for your little faith, know you only need a mustard seed. And focus on God and not on our lameness, not on the mountains, because when we focus on God, what will happen is that our faith will grow. When we focus on God. Let's pray. Will you pray with me? Thanks for sticking with me long. I got a little convoluted in my story. <laughs> Lord, will the worship team come up here? Lord, we just love you. God, help us to take our eyes off of the impossible and put on the, our eyes on the God who said all things are possible to him who believes. Help us to take our, our eyes off of our worries and our problems and our concerns and our failures and our want, want things to happen and our desires that, that are godly and yet aren't happening. Help us to take our eyes off of those, Jesus, and put our eyes on you. Father, the scripture tells us, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our what? Faith. You are the protector. You are the perfecter, the author and the perfecter of my faith. And so Jesus, this morning, will you just pray this with me? Jesus, this morning, I put my eyes on you. David prayed in Psalm 34, oh, magnify the Lord, not magnify problems. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let's exalt his name together. How often, God, do we exalt problems because they just become so huge in our focus? Instead, Lord, we choose to exalt you. We exalt you. And God, work a deep level of repentance in us so that we never take the Savior for granted. Help us to leave here and go home and own our sin and own our issues and own our problems and own our failures, knowing that all have failed and fallen short of the glory of God, and yet with you there is forgiveness and washing and cleansing. And Lord, as we repent, will you build our faith? Increase my faith, Jesus. You who can heal a lame man can heal a computer. You can heal an iPhone. You can heal me. You can heal my loved ones. God, I wanna have faith for my loved ones that the way Peter and John had faith, Peter had faith to pick that guy up. Build that kind of faith in me. Build that kind of faith in me. You stand with me. You stand.